Welcome to Mind the Tech. Thank you for joining us. Good to be here. Um, Thanks to all of Israel for coming to New York. <laughs> so uh, maybe we start Foursquare. Everybody knows Foursquare, or many people know Foursquare for a check-in app, um, giving you the best recommendations of restaurants and bars and, and other locations. How many, how many are here in the crowd use it? Foursquare used it? Know of it? Wow, you see. So uh, everybody knows Foursquare this way, but the company has evolved and uh, evolved dramatically. So can you tell us about how the company has shaped since? Sh sure. Uh, and in full disclosure, Isaac is an investor in Foursquare, so <laughs> he knows this well. Uh, so. Foursquare obviously started in 2009 with the check-in and people all around the world, 60 million people helped map 105 million business and other locations in the world in 190 countries. Uh, but today the, the company is very much a, a location technology platform. So 99% of the business, and I've been with the business five years and, and CEO almost four years, 99% uh, of the business is helping over 100,000 other companies be contextually aware as phones move through the world. So, you know, our core tech we call Pilgrim, which is the ability to detect whether the phone, if you've opted in uh, to a service, uh, has entered or exited 105 million places in 190 countries just from the phone being in your purse. We recognize different floors of different buildings because there's different uh, Wi-Fi permutations on every floor of a building, Bluetooth, a GPS signal distortion. If you know GPS, it doesn't work very well in crowded urban areas. We map those distortions systematically since we've had the advantage of 13 billion times people have said uh, I'm at a certain place. But now, uh, yeah, you probably experience Foursquare is very different. If you type the Appella Center into Uber today, that's Foursquare technology at work inside Uber. If you were to tag a tweet with the Appella Center today on Twitter, that's our technology, uh, our API powering Twitter. If you were to get a geo, if you take a snap of Isaac and I and you get a geo filter, uh, you know, and Snapchat, that's our technology as well in Snap. Uh, if you have a Samsung phone, we almost a billion times a day help Bixby uh, intelligently tag photos inside. Some, so we are essentially a, a B2B company, uh, although we still have uh, tens of millions of consumers, but, uh, but we reach over a billion consumers through, through our partners, which include Apple and Tencent and Microsoft and lots of other uh, companies. So that's very much what we are today, and we, we leverage you know, nine billion place visits we see a month in the world to uh, help marketers reach the right person with the right message based on, you know, understanding moms who, who love yoga and shop at Whole Foods or, uh, you know, people who are into CrossFit. Uh, those are different consumer segments and we can, we can help marketers understand that. So that's a very much uh, how the business works today. And how do, how do you shape it to products, into products? What sort of product? Yeah, so about half of what we do is helping 150,000 other mobile apps with contextual awareness. So we have APIs and SDKs. We call our developer tools. And then the other half is, is all kinds of a toolkit for, for marketers and brands and product makers. So uh, we, for instance, help TripAdvisor uh, on the developer tools understand, let's say you're traveling in Paris and you're outside a cafe and your friend Isaac loves this cafe, go in, you know, turn the corner, you're around the corner from maybe Bertillon on Ile de la Cité, go in and order the orange chocolate ice cream. That kind of social layer over the entire world is the kinds of products we, we, we make. We also help Tinder make Tinder places where we will, uh, if you opt in, pair you with people who you know, go to the same dog park in Brooklyn every morning or, or like the same uh, you know, uh, cold brew coffee shop. And so all of these things are opt-in. And then on the marketer side, we're, we'll talk a little about this, but we can do very cool stuff like 90% of the economy is in the real world. So we help marketers, for instance, understand if people saw an ad, are they more likely to visit a Subway sandwich shop, one of our clients, so in the 25,000 Subway sandwich shops across North America. And we're able to sort of measure the propensity to visit over the next week or two for phones who saw that ad versus phones who did not. Those are kind of attribution and uh, marketing tools, for instance, and analytics. So, so connecting the digital world and physical world is, is such a... An, actually, when we look at it, uh, the digital world, we know everything about consumers, about our customers in the digital world. We know where they 
go around in the net. We know what they do on social networks and, and the physical world we know very little about. So how do you think it's going to shape the consumer marketing going forward, you know, all this connection? And why is the, and why is the gap still so, so big? Well, I think uh, there's, there's layers in, in what you're asking. Um, from an economics point of view, I think if you ask uh, the average person, at least in the United States, and I don't know how it is in Israel, but you know, what percent of spending occurs on Amazon? Uh, in the US, anyone have a guess what percent of consumer spending in the United States is on Amazon today, the leader in e-commerce? Any guesses? 3%, okay, that's very, it's 4%, good guy. We have a smart crowd here. Uh, but you know, most people will tell me, oh, 20, 30%, right? It's, the, the economy is 90% offline, especially when you include things like groceries and auto and obviously eating out, which is an increasing trend. Um, and, and that's not even including housing and real estate, which uh, the Lumi executive talked about. And so you know, the, the economy is still in the real world. And I would argue in your life, I mean, if you are spending your entire life scrolling a social feed, you are missing out on real life, real friends, real people, real memories, experiencing the world. And so both the economy and, and you know, the most valuable moments in life happen in the real world. And so when I, I came from e-commerce, I, I, I ran an $11 billion marketing for Travelocity with $11 billion travel company. And when I met Dennis Crowley, the founder of Foursquare, I was inspired because here was a way to connect the digital world where people are getting their information and making it personal uh, and contextual to where you are right now. And are you arriving at your desk for the thousandth time? Or are you at Yankee Stadium and it's about to rain and we help AccuWeather understand you better get an Uber now? Or you're at your desk and it really doesn't matter whether it's going to rain. And so those are the kinds of contextual clues. Is this place familiar? Is it new? Are you traveling? that we want technology, whether it's AI or augmented reality in the future, to understand to make consumer experiences better. Now, it sort of begs the question probably around privacy and consumer control, which I think we'll talk about. But this, this, this technology only works if people trust it. And there's a code of conduct to protect privacy and consumer control. So that's, uh, we're, we, we've talked a lot lately about trying to build an ethical tech company. And there aren't enough folks trying to build ethical tech. And we sort of feel like data is a privilege. There was the, you know, the allusion to intelligence. And it, you know, there's this line between creepy and cool. And we're trying to find that, that perfect line. And we need consumers to be in on the dialogue around that and to be in control. And if you don't want to participate, you should be able to opt out. We support uh, a US privacy law akin to GDPR. And we, in fact, took the step of implementing GDPR rights like right to be forgotten, right to portability and access, uh, transparent opt-in in everything we do globally not just in, in Europe where it's the law. So that's, that's something we could talk about. And where is it going to? Which granularity? You know, now you track people in malls. You're going to track them in the stores. Are you going to... Because we see a lot of... Actually, one of the areas where we see now fascinating also in the Israeli tech is the retail technologies. We see a lot of retail technologies. There's like a comeback. We used to... Retail was not such a hot topic in our investments, and suddenly there are many, many yeah. retail-oriented. We're starting to look at technologies that are seeing exactly which brands you see on the shelves and direct you on the shelves and see how does location fits with all that? Where do you see the granularity going? You know, uh, obviously with 5G, um, you hear about much greater accuracy. I think it remains to be seen how much greater accuracy. There's the, the theory uh, and the practice when you have dense buildings. And 5G, for instance, is a very high frequency radio wave. So it doesn't handle concrete and glass and interference very well. It doesn't travel well long distances. So you'll see people talking about 5G will be millimeter accuracy. Um, I'm a little skeptical that that will work in practice, but when you combine lots of different technologies, it's going to get much better. One of the things we're really working on here, and this is for commercial, is that people think GPS is great, but it's a very uh, mixed technology to date. And um, inside a mall, there are different floors. GPS lat long doesn't tell you whether you're at the Macy's on the third floor or the Starbucks on the first floor. It's just a lat long. And so we're working really hard to be able to better identify the digital fingerprint of every store in the mall, and even detect the difference between someone who's driving by, let's say, a McDonald's, and actually did an under two minutes a drive-through visit to a mobile Starbucks or a mobile McDonald's, and sort of understanding the context and movement so that we can understand if you walk by a store or actually made a stop. Um, and there's obviously commercial applications to that. But then there's also 
the future of AI and augmented reality and real estate analytics and all of these things, because if we really understand how people use space, then we can open up tons of disruption in industries. And that's kind of how we see our next decade. So let's go back to privacy for a minute. So, so let's go again. Where do you set the bar? Um, where do you see regulations going? Because it's, a, it's an important topic. I saw some, some researchers saying 75% of people actually say they're willing to give their information to, to brands they trust as opposed to maybe just giving their information, so. Yeah, I mean, we, this is a really hot topic in the United States, um, and we've been out pretty vocally saying there should be privacy legislation, and when I think about um, sort of three kind of pillars of how we think privacy should be implemented when it comes to location, because look, look we've, we started out as a consumer app, so we have this DNA of, we built this technology to be so accurate so that we can make your life better, not to engage in surveillance capitalism per se, like it'd be you know piggish about it. It's, 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 we make these tech to make people's lives better, and so you know we 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 say it should be opt in and really transparent, and there should be a value to the consumer. You know, a flashlight app should not be asking for your location persistently. That's just outrageous. Um, what is the va what is the the value that you get, and is it transparent how the data will be used? And then secondly, you should be have ongoing control of data, the right to, to port your data, to own it, to delete it. Um, and thirdly, we, we sort of assert there should be a, what we call a Hippocratic Oath for data science. And it do no harm. There should be almost a fiduciary obligation on the part of data science to use the data in ways that won't harm consumers. I mean, I'm, you know, I see bad behavior out there, and we won't participate in it. We turn down opportunities that would be lucrative all the time because it just doesn't fit our code of ethics. Um, example is there's an app, and I won't say the name of the app, but it, it, um, it invites you to, it sort of offers this great service, which is you can monitor your children, and if they drive too fast, um, that you'll get an alert as a parent that your kids are driving over 60 miles per hour, right? It's, a, it's an app that you can monitor your kids and your, your family members, and there's a lot of utility to that. What they don't disclose is they're selling the, the sort of number of <laughs> traffic violating speeds of your children to the insurance companies to then differentially price car insurance. I, I don't think anyone's opting in with knowledge of how that data would be used. That would be, in our, that wouldn't pass muster, you know, we, we said no to that in like a millisecond. Because I just don't think that's how, that's how you build a long-term trust. Um, but on the other hand, like we're working with a veterans organization, um, obviously everyone in Israel serves in the military almost, and um, here we have a lot of problems with mental health of veterans, uh, PTSD and the like. And we're working with a group called Objective Zero, and they provide mental health services to military veterans where there's a very high rate of suicide. And they're using our tech now in this experimental way to understand on an opt-in basis for the former soldiers, have their life patterns changed in ways that require a social health intervention to try to get social services to that person. If they normally get up and go to the gym or go to work, and now all of a sudden for a couple of days they're not, the patterns are very different you would be concerned, and that might trigger just a phone call from a social worker. Um, and this is an opt-in service, but this is kind of how we see location as a window to your context and social utility. And so that's why we're, we really feel strong there should be privacy legislation. But if you write it poorly, um, you have the, the risk that what's going to happen is you just entrench the power of Google and Facebook, because they have armies of lawyers, and they will be fine. But it's, uh, it's the startups in Israel and around the world that are trying to do useful things and be alternatives. I mean, just, there was a, a story, we were talking about this article, uh, Google Maps, which maybe was several million. They just announced yesterday. Yeah. Right? They just, well, they, they made this move last year, but there was a big article about it yesterday. Uh, Google raised their prices to startups that want to use Google Maps services by 500%. Um, and... You know, if there's only Google Maps, uh, <laughs> you, you're stuck. So we've been, we really see ourselves as, as an independent platform. We have 150,000 companies that depend on us. We're, we're much friendlier <laughs> and much nicer than Google Maps is to them. And, but, and this isn't just theoretical. I mean, the reason why Uber came to us is they don't 
want to be beholden to Google, and Samsung isn't, doesn't want to be beholden to Google, and I could go on an Apple and Tencent and WeChat and all, you know, Twitter, all these companies do not want to be fully systematically dependent on Google, which is the history and Facebook of changing the rules on their partners in a heartbeat, and if you don't have an alternative, you're in trouble. That's why our partners come to us, and that's why I think it's important for the location industry to have an independent platform. So we're done. So last question, personal question. You, uh, you went to Oxford. You were uh, a White House fellow at the Clinton administration. You thought to become a politician. These are interesting times now in politics for us, especially in Israel. You ended yeah. up being in a startup. <laughs> So uh, tell us a little bit about the, this journey. Well, I'll, I'll try to be brief because I see that zero back there on time left. Um, the, uh, I mean, the, the thing about it, is, and it was wonderful, and I'm mostly people here from the startup nation uh, that share this. I mean, I started out working on economic development in Latin America. I worked on Middle East peace, believe it or not, uh, uh, with my old boss, Michael Porter, for many years. Uh, I was in Gaza and Jordan and Egypt and Tel Aviv. Um, and. Uh, uh, I worked on climate change for the Clinton administration. I mean, these are all things that, that matter, and they still matter, and there's still problems. Uh, I'm probably the only like Jewish kid who gave a speech on economic development at the Gaza Chamber of Commerce once. Um, but uh, you know, I, I, uh, I, you know, these were hard things. And uh, with a group of friends from the White House, we started an internet company in 1999. It was a travel company for last minute travel. And we, we grew it in two years to 125 million in sales. And it was so fun. I mean, it was so exhilarating because I wasn't writing a report for some big company or some government. I was, I was out there just doing stuff with an incredible group of friends and seeing if the world responded. And that is, Exhilarating. That's why I've been in startups for 20 years, and it's a it's a privilege. We live at a very lucky time. It was alluded to, when venture capitalists will give. I was 29. You know, we got 15 million dollars to go build a business from Goldman Sachs and General Atlantic. That's that doesn't happen in most of history. Most of history, you know, human beings are peasants for most. You know, and, and so this kind of incredible, exhilarating moment we live to build useful businesses is such a privilege. And I guess the challenge for all of us and to all of you is let's build ethical technology companies, not just high-tech companies. So thank you. Thank you. Very insightful.